This episode is brought to you by our Patreon supporters. Become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash into the portal. Halloween, or All Hallows' Eve, is something that evokes primordial senses, an evening that allows one to let go of the conventional bounds of the day and give in to something darker. Essences of the underworld, the realm of the dead, which defines our present and tells our future. Join us on Into the Portal for something a little different this week, as we share with you some legends and take a look into the ancient history of this night we call Halloween. Hello, and welcome back into the portal. I'm Amber Ray. And I'm Andrew McKay. And welcome back, as mm-hmm. usual. It's getting close to a special day. It's like we're waiting for Christmas. <laughs> it kind of feels like, like it. <laughs> <laughs> And it's like, I've always loved Halloween, but I feel like starting this show this year has definitely like amped that up by a million. And then, you know, following all the other paranormal shows and stuff, and everyone just gets so psyched for Halloween that it's just become like this... It's just, I mean... It's coming. We're, we're stoked. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so we've got a really cool Halloween special for you guys. Um, before we get started, though, we would love to thank a new patron in our Patreon yes. community. Definitely. Um, yeah. Shout out to... Uh, Chris! To Chris over from A Dash of Science podcast. Yeah. Thank you so much, man, for joining us on our uh, Patreon uh, community. Yeah. Yes. We're really happy to have you. And we're also happy to pledge support to your podcast. Yeah. He's just getting his Patreon up and running. So if anyone's interested in the science of our world and, and just gaining knowledge, because he does a really good job of doing that in a very entertaining way. Totally. And he covers things that, like, you know... Uh, like the questions uh, that people often have about stuff, but that you know you never have the answers for. Like he covers, like he just covers cool stuff. He, he they, works for NASA. <laughs> he knows a lot. Yeah, well, well, and you guys would be familiar with him if you've been listening to our show. He's come yeah. on a couple times, so make sure you guys go check out a Dash yeah. of Science podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, and we also have uh, a review as well, a new brand new review uh, from the American iTunes. This comes from Two Customs. Five star review. So thank you so much. This was from Reed, mm-hmm. and it uh, did we even actually uh, did we paste oh, the actual thing? I here? didn't copy paste. That's okay. It. But you know what, Reed? Thank you, sir, <laughs> for your enthusiasm and for listening to the show. He said that he loved the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes, uh, and episodes. the Thunderbirds episode, I believe. Yeah. And there was one other one he threw out there. It well, that's was just cool. I, I love Siberia. It. There you go. That's one of my favorites. I love it when people have a favorite episode or a yeah. handful of favorite episodes. It's always neat to see what people kind of lean to in terms of uh, the bizarre. You know what I mean? And if I'm not mistaken, it's the same Reed who recently joined us on our Facebook forum. I believe it is, yeah. So thanks, bud. We appreciate yeah, you man, coming out, out and, new people on there. and just jumping in there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then what else do we have here? Well, do oh, you want to give the little reminder of our yeah, pumpkin carving? Pumpkin here? carving contest yes doesn't even have to be a pumpkin dudes it could no. be um a, a a beet a rutabaga a rutabaga a, a carrot gourd. a carrot a ca- that would be awesome <laughs> bonus points if you carve a carrot like yeah. a jumbo carrot like seriously a jumbo carrot. but anyways it's really easy to enter all you have to do is basically carve something and <laughs> take a picture of it and then just make sure you post it on any of our social media platforms tag us yeah um follow us as well um, to follow us for sure so that we can keep track of you and um yeah and then you're in that's pretty much it basically yeah, so we've got uh, uh, the kryptonaut boys are going to help yep. us uh judge the contest and i mean no no judging really like we no. we i am that's not a an artist way to phrase that, yeah actually, no like i guess just like we're looking them over 
over. <laughs> we're just going to take a look over them, and the ones that pop out the most, we're going to narrow it down and Man, and, uh, and pick hard. a winner. It's going to be tough. I actually didn't even think about that until now. Well, that's why I wanted to bring on those guys to kind of uh, lighten the burden. <laughs> lighten the burden. So thanks for all of um, No, it's going to be super fun, because I love their perspectives on everything. So it's going oh, to be hilarious, it's I gonna think. It's going to be a the, good uh, time. Yeah. And if we can, rec- we're going to try to record that. If yeah. we can. So I, I don't know exactly if that's going to be doable, but anyway, that'd we'll be a perfect world. We'll try and figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so get those in and uh, yes, bonus points for episode related stuff. Of course. Now, yes. We ready to kind of jump into what we're talking about this evening? Mm, well, it seems fitting that we're coming down to the wire here, end of the month. We decided we are going to do a sort of a a walk through time in in the sort of traditions of Halloween. Yeah. We didn't come up with a great name for that. Shoot. <laughs> <laughs> well, but it's like a history of Halloween. It's kinda. basically a history of Halloween. I mean, we we kind of realized this year that there was a lot about it that we didn't know. Yeah. And uh, so we got we we started researching some background and we thought it'd be fun to kind of take a walk around the world and in through the the past of Halloween. Through the ages. Through the ages, so to speak. Exactly. So, we are going to start with um with the origins, of course, mm-hmm. and Amber's going to kick us off here. Exactly. Well, Halloween, of course, was not always known as Halloween. Mm-mm. It stretches back throughout history, has become known as All Hallows' Eve. Even before that, the Celtic origins of Samhain, the festival. Um, right. Yeah, so that was the most ancient uh, form of this sort of... Um, yearly celebration it was almost for them the transition between the realm of the living the 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 season of life and then the season of death it was almost a new year so to speak in a way yeah no Mm -hmm. totally it actually makes more sense like yeah the transition period between seasons makes more sense as a new year it actually does the more i thought about it because like our new year's Eve is not January. nothing really happens what's so special it only it? gets colder it does <laughs> and it's just not nice for right. the rest of the season but this is makes a lot of sense it was a very big celebration with huge significance for the entire community um it go, went on for about three days um is the tradition right starting on october 31st kind of going into november 2nd was the um sort of idea i got okay and basically this was a time when the dead and the living intermingled um there were lots of sacrifices of valuables animals um things like that to the spirits of the underworld so to speak there were lots of fortunes predicted um the druid priests were particularly active during this time their communications with the other world again right. were heightened supposedly and um and people even dressed up in the skins of animals and uh it was just a time where there was almost it seemed as if there were no rules right. it was like things were suspended and yeah. it was almost like the way that I think about it, it was like living in a state of purgatory, so to speak. Okay. Yeah. That makes it definitely sound ominous when you put it that way. Mm-hmm. I think it was, um, it was, it could be taken either on either side of the fence, so, so to speak, as like a, you know, a day that's positive or a day that's maybe a little bit more linked to things like that. I found it interesting, even just the pronunciation, like it's, pr- pr- it's spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N and mm-hmm. pronounced Samhain. And we were talking about the Celts just recently with our episode last week with the Hexham, or sorry, uh, two weeks ago with the uh, the Hexham Heads mm-hmm. episode. And so this was just kind of funny coming right back into the Celts. And we got into a little bit of their past. You know, this is this is way predating, obviously, modern Christianity or the birth of Christ and things oh, like definitely. that. And predating even some, some Roman ties to, um, mm-hmm. to ha- what we know as Halloween. But, um, oh yeah, I didn't really give a date. Sorry, guys. That's okay. <laughs> well, I mean, we're, the Celts, we, we mentioned this before, like the Celts were kind of, it, they covered massive swaths of territory and there was a, but it's, that's sort of a vague broad strokes term for mm-hmm. a lot of different They were on mainland groups. Europe as well as in the British Isles. Right. And, uh, that is actually interesting. We covered the Celts in our exhibits. Yeah. I didn't even really think about the connection there. Yeah. But again, yeah, the most ancient sort of form of this type of celebration that kind of is loosely tied to this time. Uh, So again, like we're saying, like this is obviously um, before Common Era. Yeah. Um, By the time about, I believe, uh, 43 AD, 
or was it 43 BC, 43, 43 AD, it was sort of transitioning into a more Christianized version. Right. And uh, this was obviously with the advent of Roman invasion across um, Northern Europe and into, uh, yeah, the British um, territories there. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, this was very interesting. Um, we do see a lot of influence in today's classic motifs of Halloween um, evoked in these traditions that are largely ancient. Mm -hmm. We do see some injections of Roman traditions. Um, I believe the festival of, I think it's Pomola or Pomona. Um, so basically it's this, um, this Roman goddess who is symbolized by the apple. So that's another sort of motif, you know, like bobbing for apples. Yeah, a lot okay. of people believe that that came from this sort of Roman injection into the Celtic traditions. Interesting. Um, celebration of the apple, you know, like, again, obviously that's a symbol of harvest too. Of course, yeah. So you can kind of loosely base it around that. Oh, we know all about that, don't we? Yeah. Um, obviously, again, we do see the first sort of, um, sort of, I don't even know what you would say, like um, the beginnings of what we would call trick-or-treating and dressing up, all those types of traditions. So yeah. we're going to get into all of that tonight. Definitely, definitely. Which is just so much fun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it makes me miss being a kid. It like, really Like, not does. that the uh, Samhain festival was for children, obviously. This was no. for, well, it was for everyone, but it was... Uh, How about consequence? Yeah, much more. Mm -hmm. it, that's what it was about. It was exactly. about, yeah, being aware of this transition time and knowing what to do to protect yourself yourself and knowing what to do to respect the dead. Exactly. So in its most ancient forms, I guess, well, before we get into the motifs, I think we should get into the more, the, the classic legends that preceded them and the sort of, um, you had a couple that you pulled up, hey, Andrew? Yeah, they sure. Really so they, they're super interesting and they're, they're, they're kind of vague. Like they're not, I pulled this up from a few different blogs, um, but Non unconfirmed. Let's just say, like they are indeed legends. They're okay. folk folk tales because there was no written record. At That's this time. one thing, and also they're just amalgamated over time, right? It's really Definitely. it's tough to, and it might even be partially Christianized too, which we see a lot of. So definitely, um, one of the there. interesting ones though uh, is an old folk tale from the region. It says that on the night of Samhain. Owls, great owls, so like great horned owls, presumably, or mm -hmm. larger owls would would swoop down to eat the souls of the dead. Mm -hmm. Now, how they would be going about this, I don't know, but it's just like the idea of owls as a kind of important figure in Celtic. I, 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 I didn't like actually that. go into that, but it's just like... We love owls. Like, they're such a weird-looking, like, awesome bird. Whenever I think of owls, I think of the Flatwoods monster now. <laughs> <laughs> so, basically, it goes on to say, according to mountain legends, an owl hooting at midnight would signify death is coming. And likewise, if you would see an owl um, circling around during the day, it meant that it, there was bad news coming for somebody nearby. And mm. the importance of animals is all is definitely, like prevalent and we touched on this again in hexam episode because there was that occult celtic site where they dug up all these uh hybrid this hybrid yeah. animal burial site thing right oh yeah so anyway i thought that was kind of neat this these the legends surrounding uh the owls but there was mm -hmm. no real mention of like death gods in celtic origin but i pulled some up anyway like they they were never really mentioned in relation to Samhain, but mm -hmm. apparently there was celtic gods of the dead were known as uh gwyn up Nude for the British and hmm. Arwan in Welsh. Celtic oh, that's Welsh. interesting. Okay. I thought that was kind of interesting. Another so like gods oh, of the underworld, kind of, so to speak. Yeah, something like along those lines. Another flying creature legend related to Samhain night was the idea that bats are also obviously out and about, and this is super like iconic with of all course. of Halloween, right? Of course. And it basically meant that good weather is coming. So it's kind of funny. It's like the owls are a negative legend potentially and, and the bats were the opposite huh. and during the middle ages the bat was of course associated with negative things so this switched over and this is because of the Christ yeah. christian uh you know changes being made to Samhain and the legends of Samhain mm. and so it was basically became linked to of course dark magic sorcery witchcraft yeah spells. that's what you put in the brew right exactly <laughs> um so they were seen as like delivering messages between witches and the devil so when oh. bats were flying over top of you i oh thought dear. that was kind of an interesting thing and then last but not least kind of the most important of them all i think we're all wondering this is did the celts you know sacrifice people were there human sacrifices on halloween and of course that's sort of the that is that's one of the things people think of when you think of like 
you know, the negative Christian view of Halloween, I guess, like that Mm -hmm. you come up with tales that are extremely dark or whatever. Mm -hmm. But there is some general agreement amongst researchers that there were human sacrifices, just not on Samhain, that in general, there were human sacrifices practiced amongst the Celts. But these were usually limited to like criminals, prisoners of war, or people like volunteering to be sacrificed. So like elderly, Mm -hmm. almost like going out on the ice flow type of thing. Interesting. Apparently. Well, because I, obviously we did come across this with the Hexham heads and the whole idea that um, the idea, yeah, that the head was so central um, in their symbology and in their religious practices that mm-hmm. it was obviously a symbol of prowess if you did have the heads of your enemies kind of like spear Oh, yeah, around. they were beheading all the time. They were beheading. <laughs> I actually had an interesting comment on Facebook today about a possible connection to head cults and, and just um, werewolf motifs in sculptures and stuff. I haven't actually had a chance to really look into it yet, but I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. Hexam, hey, it just keeps going. It just keeps coming up. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Uh, that's very interesting, though, that you're bringing up sacrifice here because, um, yeah, starting to get a little dark here. Yeah. So... And so obviously the Christians were not very crazy about this when they started to come in and see what these pagan crazy folk were doing so yeah like, like it was from their perspective <laughs> it was obviously seen as like a direct threat the idea that there was a link between the living and the dead and the idea too that it's not um a monotheistic spiritual world where right. it, there are yeah exactly these sorts of um tears and connections or something you could say between these two realms and totally. that it's not ruled over by like you know like an all-powerful deity and so of course speak. and of course the idea that druid priests were the ones uh, amongst the celts who were you know in the oak forest and had that. the knowledge and mm-hmm. were accessing you know you know performing divination ceremonies to like access the spirits and stuff like that that's that's no, the no. uh those are the, your biggest threat to those people exactly if yeah. you're the church they have the they most are. authority within their communities right yeah. so all very interesting yeah um, again obviously um, Samhain eventually developed into what is known as All Souls Day, followed by All Hallows Eve, which is actually just a euphemism for saint. Hallow is a saint. Mm-hmm. I didn't actually know that. So that's a fun little fact. Yeah, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> One of the, uh, I pulled up actually here, this is a little bit more modern, but just to give oh, an yeah. idea of like the sort of, uh, the messages being sent from the, the Catholic and Christian backgrounds of Halloween is basically saying that Samhain was a god and not just a festival. Like, so the message is a lot of that. Samhain was the Celtic god of the dead and worshipped by the Druids, <laughs> which is just false. Yeah. Outright false. And oh, you find no. that all over online if you search around, like, oh, the dark past of Halloween, and you'll get it on, like, JehovahsWitness.org oh. and different things like that. Basically saying that, uh, well, okay, there's there's a comic book that came out from this guy named, like, Jack Chick was this mm-hmm. one example. I think this was older. This was, like, in the 60s or 70s or something like that. It looked pretty retro. But this is just, like, one example of thousands of examples, obviously, of sort of this backward message saying that druid priests on Halloween would essentially go from house to house, castle to castle, and steal young women in order to, obviously, defile them and then sacrifice them Ooh. to the gods on, of Samhain. Oh, dear. Um, oh, dear. So basically, basically just saying Halloween is, is pagan devil worship, essentially is the, the hard line stance against Halloween coming Mm -hmm. from religious, uh, that's, that's kind of harsh. Yeah. But I I just, that this, it just goes to show how that was the, I mean, yeah. So that's very modern, right? That's that's sort of a more modern take, but I mean, this is what you get out of, uh, yeah, that early Christianization of Halloween, of taking away of shunning the pagans and uh that's so interesting because the original christianization of the event or the the festival or whatever you want to call it the holiday has been completely lost there Mm -hmm. right because it was initially sort of converted to celebrate saints so it's actually kind of odd that we don't have that as an official holiday anymore all and saints day totally just got I lost know, right? in the ages and it's sort of ironic that like the it is linked all saints day is linked to these ancient ceremonies and the transition into you know halloween as it as it stands today or whatever but mm-hmm. then we have you know the modern commercialized version of halloween and that's what like hardline you know yeah. religious people take a stance against being like you know don't dress up like you know you're, you're dressed up like a witch like that's that's devil worship or whatever and things like that. Yeah. Yet, yet, yet it's actually so closely linked in and of itself. It is very you know funny. I mean? it's... So yeah. So like that is a very interesting transition and 
kind of that's just a disconcerting perspective of the modern perspective Indeed. i should say but it, yeah so again like we were alluding to celts kind of have the reigns as far as it being the most ancient you do get the introduction of Roman Catholicism, all that kind of stuff. And essentially, popes start getting involved here. Yeah. So by about 609 AD, we get Pope number one, Boniface the fourth. Um, <laughs> pope number one? I love you put number, number. Like you literally number spelt it. One. <laughs> <laughs> well, come on, man. Anyways, um, he, he dedicated um, this pantheon of Rome. So pantheon is just like this ancient structure it was completed and it's one of the best preserved monuments in ancient rome anyway so that's kind of a side note um so he dedicated this pantheon in honor of all the martyrs of the catholic faith and eventually it kind of got converted to all saints hmm. um gregory this third ended up changing it about 200 years later uh, and it was interesting too because actually um all saints or all martyrs day i should say it was actually may 13th and then he ended up changing it. Pope Gregory changed it to November 1st. And it was just a political move on the part of the church because they did want to make those changes right, in, of course. in foreign lands. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where we end up in the sort of early Middle Ages with these sorts of early transitions. But you do get um, the, the sort of... Uh, the perseverance of the pagan tradition. So things like, like we mentioned, um, dressing up, going yeah. door to door, um, asking for food or treats. Yeah. Um, as well as the lighting of hollowed out vegetables um, that had very early origins. Am um, I missing any? I don't know. So let's go through these, like one by one. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, starting with dressing up, the idea of costume. And changing, yes. like yeah. I, I, I think this is so cool because obviously it's the most fun part about Halloween. Mm -hmm. But in the Celtic tradition, like you mentioned earlier on, it was this transition time, and it was kind of cool. We get sort of two sides of this. It's like the one version is like you dress up during Samhain to blend in amongst the spirits. It's mm -hmm. almost like a form of protection. It's like a camouflage. Camouflage. If you came across one, you're all alone. Yeah, you. It would mistake you as another spirit, and exactly. you'd be okay. Right. Which, Which is, is funny, so eh? cool. It's it's just, but it's it's again. It's like this idea that the rules are suspended. You can be who you're not. Right. It almost reminds me of um, oh, what's it called down in uh, New Orleans? They have that day where <laughs> oh, like crazy. like oh yeah yeah, yeah like a Mar like Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Totally. With all the masks and stuff are so important with that too. Exactly. So that's sort of like the one version. It's almost like a protection, and then the other side is to make them feel welcome. You know, you're, the, mm. the costumes are to look like them so that the spirits can come out. Mm -hmm. and, and, and and this is the time when the the barriers between the worlds of the living and the dead were the most thin, mm -hmm. is another way of thinking about it. Definitely. It wasn't just the transition time, but if you believe it to be literally two different worlds or dimensions or however you want to think about it, mm -hmm. that's when the rotation of the earth and the changing of the seasons made it really thin between that portal. Ooh, yes. And I even saw, like, there was... Um, some young men would just, well, not young men, but some individuals would become so enamored with um, the festivities and just like, almost like, just like a feverish sort of, um, I don't even know, like um, ritualistic dancing and mm -hmm. stuff. And they would get so involved. Like it was almost like they were, yeah, in a trance or they were communicating like shamanistically right. with uh, spirits. And so stuff that's like, that. like, or spirits were coming into them and becoming them. Kind exactly. Of thing. Like a form of reverse divination or something. Yeah, Totally. So you had people dressing up, obviously, originally with, like, you know, uh, animal skins, mm -hmm. other types of very basic costume. And, of course, this evolved into, like, the classic kind of bed sheet type thing that you would, that you'll see, like, in retro photographs and stuff like that. But that's what Homemade it would have been. It was costumes. literally, like, you know, think picture, like, the 1700s, 1600s, and people celebrating this festival and just trying to blend in with what they perceived as spirit, the spirit world. Yeah. What are you going to wear? I don't know. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> Something dark and creepy yeah. maybe, and just, yeah, masked. Totally. It's kind of interesting how, like, yeah, like, masks would have played such an important role, and today we don't even, like, allow kids to wear masks. Well, you can you can wear masks as part of your costume. You just can't wear it to school, I guess. Is the yeah, we rule. got pretty strict about that. Yeah, so I guess for good reason, if you want to believe some of the legends. Mm, but, uh, yeah, so the other huge one, obviously, is trick-or-treating. Right. And, again... 
like we've said, this was a time when the rules kind of were suspended and normal customs that would be like, you know, um, adhered to were just kind of let go of. And so this included um, the <laughs> acceptability of begging, so to speak. So eventually, well, children mostly, but um, not so well off adults as well, beggars and such would go from house to house asking for food in exchange for song or prayer. Um, way back in the day, this uh, practice was termed souling, like s- your soul. Yeah. And the children who did this were called soulers or individuals who practiced this. So I thought that was cool. And then eventually costumes were incorporated into the tradition, but mostly it involved some sort of performance or some sort of act of gratitude, so to speak. And um, most often what was given um, to the solars was something called a soul cake (laughs) or also known as a heart cake too by some people. And they were just these little small cakes and they often had crosses on top of them, which kind of symbolized a soul being freed from purgatory as when the cake was eaten. Yeah. So they were obviously kind of sweet and they had very fall flavors. So cinnamon, raisins, ginger, nutmeg, everything you'd find in the pie, essentially. That sounds really good. Sounds really yummy. Yeah. And it didn't really like, obviously this tradition did move to North America with the advent of colonization and all this kind of stuff. And um, the Irish and the Scots um, kind of carrying on the traditions of the Celts and everything. Um, kind of, yeah, they, obviously they continued on with this practice and it yeah. became known as trick-or-treating. And this is a very, very brief summary of this whole history. I don't want anyone to think that this is like a comprehensive overview because we're not claiming to know everything No, about not at all. And um, there's a lot of rabbit holes to go down. Oh, too. for sure, yeah. If we were really going to do a history of Halloween, honestly, we would have to take a couple of months. And yeah. Then- Exactly, because a lot of websites you come across, they have the same information, and I don't mean to be critical of history.com, but I'm pretty sure they plagiarized an earlier blog. We've that noticed actually, that a few different times. Yeah, like they had it copyrighted in 2007, and then literally word for word, verbatim paragraphs were in full reproduced <laughs> in a later, and they said they had it copyrighted until like 2009. Right, so. and we try to get our hands on hard copies of stuff whenever we can, but it's oh, time. Yeah. time. But anyways, I was kind of disheartened with that, but... Anyways, just just getting back to what we're talking about. Um, So this tradition, right, is becoming a little bit more modern. Um, It, again, becomes trick-or-treating, and it gets quite nasty. Yeah. So instead of it being souling, um, it became, like, guising, and then also, like, there were these, like, kids were getting mean about it. Like, they weren't... It wasn't an exchange of a treat for a performance or a song or a prayer or something. It, was a it became threat, exactly that. It was like not it was it was a demand. Right. <laughs> and there was actually um I, I heard well I heard I read that there were actually recorded accounts where kids would set up like barricades in neighborhoods and they wouldn't allow anyone to pass. And uh and also very nasty uh, pranks, so things like um, opening up the barn so like, yeah. all the animals would Letting escape, all their animals out. <laughs> or taking um, the wheels off of people's like wagons or something, sure. whatever, anything yeah. they could do. Yeah. I didn't hear anything about egging. I wonder when egging came around. Well, you wouldn't be throwing away good food. What about TP? We didn't even do TP. Well, you can't throw away good TP either. <laughs> <laughs> Remember in Bob's Burgers, the Halloween episode, it's like, <laughs> Tina, you know you're going to have to put that back on the roll when you get back, right? <laughs> She's got her mummy costume. I'm a mummy. That's a mummy. <laughs> She's got a little baby doll with her. <laughs> so oh, good. Man. But anyways. Yeah, yeah. so that that is... Isn't that funny? Hey? It's funny to think about the types of things that uh, people would have come up with or possibly done. I mean, oh, gosh, isn't, isn't I that one of the most... How rotten just, kids and, got it. And we just watched, and we're probably going to mention this a little closer to the end, but we just watched the movie Trick or Treat mm-hmm. the other night. One of our favorite Halloween movies. It's so it's great. Because so it's like, you can watch it with kids, but it's also oh. great for adults too. Maybe not young, young I, kids, but it... There's it's, some nudity in there. Oh, come on. It's like barely PG thirteen. <laughs> terms. Like, I was watching that one. It's seven. like barely <laughs> PG thirteen in terms of like how scary it is. True. There's a few moments that are quite tense, but other than that, it's quite amenable to younger audiences. I guess. Right. Right. And I feel like the most the. The, the most eerie thing about the idea of trick-or-treating and like that movie really like nailed this on the head. It's like when the doorbell rings and you don't know who's on the other side. <laughs> right? And you yeah. open it, you're expecting a kid. You maybe open it up and there's mm-hmm. nothing there. That we've been Nikki Nikki Nine Door uh, at Halloween in the past, and that is spooky. 
or the opposite, right? When you're trick-or-treating and you go up to a creepy looking house that you don't even know if anyone's home, but you think you might see a glow inside yeah, yeah. and then they open, like, you know, you're not, you're just waiting and you hear it creep, creep, creep. Right. And you're just like, um, probably should have rang this doorbell. Yeah. Like, How oh badly do you want that coffee crisp? Um, not that bad. <laughs> no, they suck. And you know what always happens too in those movies is they, they go up there and they're shaking their boots the entire time and then they drop all their candy. It's ridiculous, man. man. hold on to that bag of candy because not only are With you losing your candy, fist. but it's like bags of candy would make for half decent little weapon in a, in a oh, pinch. Oh, yeah. Swing that thing around really hard. You got hard. some hard suckers in there. <laughs> Get some cans of pop in there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I got a couple full cans of Pepsi <laughs> back in the day. Oh, yeah. Uh, yep. Well, okay, so the the devolution of trick-or-treating or souling. Yeah. Very unfortunate. There was obviously a little respite during World War II, and there was, like, sugar rationing and stuff. But then Halloween came back in full force, and there was a lot of um, modernity involved in, like, the recreation of Halloween-ness and all sorts of that kind of stuff, which we see in movies and all sorts, like even just like the rise of the Halloween series in the seventies, right? With Michael totally. Myers, yeah. all the stuff. Like, oh man, we need to do that series. Well, no. Wow. How much can you say about it? It's well, too I late could probably now, say because like we, I mean, we're too close to Halloween to cover it. But next year, I guess maybe next year. There was just the new release. Like there was the latest installment of that. Yeah. Right. So Ooh, and they have um, uh, what's her name in it? Uh, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh Jenna, my gosh. Jamie Lee. Carter. No. Curtis. Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> Jamie Lee Curtis. Yeah. Carter Curtis. Close enough. Carter Curtis. She's great, Susan though. Sarandon. Yeah, <laughs> Susan <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> oh, my God. So, we're kind of getting into, well, my favorite part about Halloween really is carving jack-o'-lanterns. And that's mm-hmm. the competition we wanted to do. And I was always kind of curious about the origins of the jack-o'-lantern and just assumed that it would have been from Samhain. But, of course... The pumpkin kind of didn't did. really make its way over. It, the, the, it did in the in terms of rutabagas and root oh, vegetables true, true, and yes. stuff like that. But like Not the, the, pumpkin. the quintessential jack o' lantern didn't uh, wouldn't have made its debut until after North American Contact. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it's funny that you say quintessential jack o' lantern because a uh, jack o' lantern was literally just a jack of the lantern. Right. So. This is cool because okay. we have a whole sort of like Halloween story about jack-o'-lanterns, but I think just right off the bat, it's just cool to think about the idea that in like a lot of traditions, including like Celtic folklore and, and European whatever, <laughs> European whatever, um, Jack, Jack, you hear this name a lot in different Spring stories. Spring Jack, Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper. Yeah, exactly. Um, Jack and the Beanstalk. Uh, all sorts of crazy stories and, yeah. and just folklore. And it's interesting because Jack, like even, um, oh my gosh, what's it called? Um, what's the, the Jack of the Winter? It's like, it's like, uh, it's what they call a snowman. Oh, oh, Jack oh, Frost. Jack Frost. Yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, my God. Wow. Wow. We should edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyways, but it's actually a really common motif for just, like, a spirit. Right. So I think that's interesting because Jack of the Lantern actually refers to a sort of a mid to late uh, medieval um, thing known as, yeah, Jack of the Lantern, which was wow. most commonly thought of as, like, this mysterious light. That was seen in bogs and forests and often had a lot of interpretations, but really what we would think of it now today is actually swamp gas. So that's (laughs) cool. And a lot of kids around All Hallows Eve would make fun of this sort of legend of the jack-o'-lantern. Um, by carving out vegetables, placing embers or whatever, small candles in them, and then running in through the woods as if they were Jack of the Lantern. Like the spirit floating through the woods. Kind of, yeah, but uh, it has an even earlier sort of origin story, too. Kind of getting ahead of myself. We're telling the story backwards here. Okay, okay. So essentially, Jack of the Lantern came from this story that has lots of different versions. Um, I, I came across so many when I was researching, but... Essentially, it's the story of Stingy Jack okay. and the Lantern. So, it goes back many hundreds of years in Irish history. Um, but the most popular rendition is of this character called Stingy Jack, who is often depicted as a drunkard, someone who enjoys the drink, often spending time in the tavern. And Stingy Jack liked 
to sting his company because he didn't like to pay for Ah, his drinks. I see. As the story goes, one night, Jack was up to his usual antics in the tavern, and he came across the devil of all people. (laughs) And not wanting to refuse a drink, Jack decided to sit down for one last one with his old pal, the devil. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a few different ways the story goes down, but one of them is that um, the devil essentially trades Jack a drink for his soul. And there's other versions of this, but essentially this happens, Jack accepts, and then the devil goes to pay, and being a shapeshifter, he turns himself into a coin and tells Jack to pay with the coin. Jack is a little bit sharper than the devil takes him for, ends up pocketing the coin next to a silver cross, preventing the devil from transitioning back into his original form. And Jack skips out on the bill and essentially holds the devil hostage until the devil agrees not to take Jack's soul when he dies. Um, And then there's another more extended version where Jack tricks the devil again by luring him up a tree, daring him, I guess. And then he ends up... This is very strange but essentially he takes about like i don't even know you need like a dozen or so crosses and hammers them into the ground all around the tree so the devil can't get down and he has the devil up in a tree so to speak and then he basically makes the devil swear that he will never take jack's soul into hell when jack dies so obviously this story has a twist or two um jack ends up dying of old age as anyone would and goes up to heaven is told by God that he has lived a terrible life and that he is a horrible human being and sends him down to hell. (laughs) And so... St. Peter kicks him in the butt. Exactly. He didn't get in. So anyways, he goes down to hell and this is where the devil has the last laugh because he remembers the promise that he made to Jack years earlier. And essentially, the devil keeps his word and does not allow Stingy Jack into hell. And he dooms Jack to forever roam the dark underworld of basically purgatory. Right. And Jack, realizing his blunder, asks the devil what he will take with him to light the way. Um, So essentially, yeah, um, he ends up (laughs) giving him a lantern. Right. And he becomes this Jack of the Woods, Jack of of the Lantern. And, uh, yeah, he's doomed forever. So That would be a terrifying... uh like a folkloric tale for young kids it's back in the day, really right? Terrifying. I mean, you see, you see that swamp gas coming from a bog oh or something, gosh, and you'd yeah. be like, you'd yeah, be running the other way. Freaky-deaky. So it's interesting, right? Because you do get an injection of Christian morals in this tale. Yeah. So it's obviously not sort of going back all the way to um, the Celtic uh, Samhain sort of festivities no. and stuff. I wonder if there was an earlier version. I couldn't come up with that, but... Essentially, in the Celtic tradition, um, adults and children would carve out vegetables in order to um, protect themselves from spirits that were wandering. Yeah. Um, So, yeah, the whole idea of, like, Jack being injected into that is very... It's a very curious... And then some people... it's, It's hard, right? Because you get... A lot of people that do a lot of summary armchair research, well, like we do sometimes, but we like to be a little more thorough and check out more than one source. Of course. But some people will say that, like, basically, oh, the Celtic tradition is basically that the children and adults will carve out vegetables to scare off Jack. And it's like, but Jack wasn't even relevant to them. He wasn't even there. wasn't even a thing. So you get these mix-ups, right? And sort of, yeah, it's it's, it's unfortunate, but again, like... um, yeah, it's so many different versions. This is an interesting quote here from Mental Floss that you added in. Oh, yeah, you want to read that one out? Sure. Um, so this is a direct quote. <laughs> so this is kind of how it uh, got the name sake with, associated with the pumpkin itself. So yeah. in America, pumpkins were easy enough to come by and good for carving, um, and they slowly got absorbed both into the carved lantern tradition and the uh, associated prank. So over time, kids refined the prank and began carving crude faces into the pumpkins to kick up the fright factor and make the lanterns look like disembodied heads. Mm-hmm. By the mid-1800s, Stingy Jack's nickname was applied to the prank pumpkin lanterns that echoed his own lamp, and the pumpkin jack-o'-lantern got its name. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of interesting. It makes sense. It kind of does. There might be a few logical mm-hmm. flaws in that, uh, uh, so, as far as yeah. the idea that um, over the time they started carving faces into pumpkins. It's like, well, uh, the the practice of car- that's just it too. That's another muddled sort of thing. Like yeah. the actual carving of faces into things versus actual just carving them out. 
you know? Yeah. Like, I would imagine that the Celt's probably a little bit more um, artistic than just carving a hole in it to, like, you know, Well, it's obviously a way. different type of thing, too. It's like you can hollow out a, a pumpkin or a squash and things like that, but the, 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 the Celtic heads, like, that's what they're their Samhain type things like remind me of, right? Like the mm. small, very simple stone heads where you take an object and it's literally just the basics of what you need. Yeah. And I find that to be way more creepy than like a detailed creepy face. Yeah. That's something I didn't get confirmation on though. And yeah. that's why we need an actual, we need a comprehensive research session of months in order to come up with all of these answers. Indeed. Unless we have like a, a Halloween school. I don't know how much right it matters now. really though. The, when, if a face is hollowed out or if it's or if it's, or if it's carved just in the yeah. importance is when it was why and when that was done exactly right mm-hmm. yeah it's interesting though because even like yeah like there are other connotations of jack-o'-lanterns which could even just be a generic term for like a man with a lantern or like a watchman that type of thing um some people yeah would refer to that it, but anyways yeah it's interesting though because like we said jack jack Jack. 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 He's everywhere. Yeah. Everywhere. Jack. Jack of legs. I've never heard of that one. Me neither. <laughs> British folklore, hey? Who who in Britain's listening, Kate? Jack in Irons? We got Ian and uh, uh, Ian a few over others. there. We got a few other uh, friends over oh, in the UK. Um, oh my gosh, the name's escaping me. Ugh, I suck. You suck with names. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> we, know, we know where you are yeah. over there. Sort of. <laughs> but it, it's interesting, though, because going back to the whole swamp gas thing, this was cute. I came up with a whole plethora of names um that would describe this so like jack-o'-lanterns obviously one of them um hinky punks that's another one uh-huh. hobby lanterns um corpse candles that's Ooh, creepy. i love that Ooh. corpse candles. fairy lights that's another okay. will will of the wisps and fool's fire i like fool's fire too because that would imply that people are like going in after it like they're like oh there's a flame we need it Let's go get the fire. Yeah, yeah. It's almost like the people from North Sentinelese Island. <laughs> <laughs> then you got to preserve it until it goes out. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, I love this. This is so much history and definitely. I'm and having it's like, a lot of a lot of. I'm having a good time with this one. Me too. Glass of wine, talking about some Halloween <sighs> stuff. It's great. Can't be uh, we wanted to kind of like just give a taste of kind of Halloween around the world too, beyond mm-hmm. just the the origins and the past and stuff. And of course, one of the main things that comes to mind for everybody has to be the the day of the dead in mexico um dia de los muertos and of course this is a misconception right because people think it is directly linked to halloween or that it is basically mexican halloween Mm, but of course it's mm -hmm. not um though it is kind of related the two events they differ in traditions and tone like halloween in the north american tradition now of course has this dark terror mischief vibe to it and then even in, when we go back and look at Samhain and the Celts it was there was elements of that it was still this time when the dead could communicate with the living but there was a bit of like okay we got to protect ourselves from it at the same time though right okay. whereas the day of the dead festivities kind of like are a little bit more joyous you know what I mean like it's mm, super colorful celebratory you're you're mm-hmm. still dressing up for the same reasons a lot of, in, a, in a way it's almost like Samhain. a New Orleans funeral yeah like oh yeah totally the vibe of it is like, exactly like that mm-hmm. like super joyous and celebratory yeah but you're still wearing the like the skeleton masks and you're still dressing up to blend in with the spirits mm-hmm. like to blend in with their, it's their day so you have to dress like them okay. you know what I mean cool I'm um, like I don't know why I'm having that image of the 007 that movie what was that one it's yeah, right where the yeah, opening scene. I love that, that opening great, scene. Yeah, totally. Really cool. Really great. Sorry. <laughs> we need to go to Mexico City for what for a Day of the Dead ceremony yes. celebration. That would Definitely. be epic. Or so, even down for that um what's that Black Mass in oh, Cata, oh, Catamarco or something like that or Oh, was that Oh, did that come up in the Las Brujas mm-hmm. episode? Oh, okay. People are loving that Las Brujas one, yeah, too. Yeah, I totally. love... Oh, man. It's such a cool topic. What's, sorry, what's sorry. even cooler, though, about the Day of the Dead is that it originated thousands of years before. So it has an ancient past, very much like Halloween has an ancient past. Cool. It originates with um, Aztec traditions. So basically, like, the, the Toltec and the Hua people and other sort of descendants of the Aztec were... They... They considered, like, mourning the dead disrespectful. So today's Dia de los Muertos is a mashup, basically, of pre-Hispanic religions where it was a little bit more kind of, like, negative mm-hmm. and the religious Christian sort of side of it, Catholic side of it, where... I guess it's... It, the Catholic side of it in the Americas, though, is different. It's different yeah. than in Europe, right? Yeah. Like, it's not the same... There isn't the same 
demonic connotations to things. No. It's a little bit more free and open over there. Yeah, a little more ambiguous. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. the reason you see everyone dressed up like with the, the skeleton masks is because of the Aztec background. So the okay. Aztecs placed a great amount of importance on the skull. Oh, yeah. And of course, where do we see this? We've been talking about this with the Celts for this whole exactly. time. Exactly. The, the head. Right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's a reminder of both life and death. It's like the seed of the soul. Exactly. Too. Yeah. So that's why you see these images of the skull or the calavera mm-hmm. are obviously very pre- present, prevalent. Um, present and prevalent. And they're displayed in different ways. Like they're displayed humorously. Um, they're displayed in sort of se- subtle, scary ways. Some of them are really colorful. Some kind of them just are more dark. More... Um, almost like um, black comedy. Almost. It's kind of the vibe. <laughs> almost. Yeah. It's because it's so playful yet. It's so like. The... It's like a death carnival. Yeah. It's almost, it's almost like a joke. Man, but it I is, really want to go to this thing. I know, right? And then I thought this was kind of interesting because I didn't know this, but apparently, like, the United Nations and U- UNESCO, like yeah. the World Heritage, yeah, you know, oh, yeah. conservation, it's not just about monuments and things and stuff. It's about days. So, actually, the Day of the Dead wow. is, like, a World Heritage Day. Cool. And I thought that that was really cool. That's neat. Yeah. Preserving it for all time. I know, right? I also pulled up Ireland. Because we've been talking about Samhain and oh, yeah. obviously the British Isles and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I was just like, well, what is going on there today? So, of course, they still celebrate Samhain in a sort of modern version, right? Cool. And apparently, like, the party of all parties for Halloween um, in the UK is in Ireland in a town called the town of Derry. Derry. Or is it like a region of Derry? I don't know. People from the UK, shout us, get at us. <laughs> Where's Derry? But apparently it's like the world's biggest Halloween party. Um, more than 30,000 people take to the streets. They're dressed up Whoa. as witches and, and monsters and vampires and ghouls and goblins. That's neat. And Why don't uh, people do that in I, Canada? It's like, it's so depressing here on Halloween. Oh, it's terrible. Like when I was a kid and we used to go out, like the streets were packed. And that isn't just my memory of it. It's like literally like there were so many kids out mm-hmm. trick-or-treating. Parties for people celebrating Halloween. There were events downtown. It was, and like, it was like so busy out that... It's funny because we actually grew up in the same neighborhood. But I remember like it would be a treat almost to get to go to a creepier or like really well-decorated house when no one else was there. Mm. Like, you know, and you're like, yes, I get it all to myself. Yeah, <laughs> totally. Because there's so many there's people. Because there's always people showing up. I hated those kids that did like the blow-by where they were just like, you're right in the middle of saying, trick or treat. And they just kind of like join in and just push past you and grab the candy and then go and they don't even say trick or treat. That would be so many times. I was a small kid. That's though. like bad juju if you don't say trick or treat and you get candy. <sighs> Speaking of bad juju, I feel like that was the theme of that trick-or-treat movie. Pretty much. Like, if you got some bad juju, Halloween spirit's gonna come and get you. I think that is still an important thing to remember with Halloween, as commercialized as it is. Yeah. That whether you believe in any of this stuff or not, or you subscribe to any one historical faith or anything or whatever, it's like, it, it it is a day of the dead. It is. It's a day to be respectful. It's, it is. Yes. Most. Yeah. Even just That's to cover most your ass. Thing <laughs> be yeah. respectful. You know what no I mean? No kidding. Um, so, okay. You I, had China pulled up here too, I know. Right? I, I thought this was kind of interesting. You're just all over the map. I know, right? So, In a good way. Yeah. <laughs> literally. <laughs> so there is a Halloween festival. It's known as uh, oh dear. Teng Che. There you go. Teng Che. That's not bad. It's as close as it's going to get for me. Sure. And what they do is essentially food and water are placed in front of photographs for family members who have departed. And then lanterns are lit in order to kind of like light their path so they can travel back to the earth on Halloween night and have this communication. So there's a really positive version of sort of the same Samhain mm-hmm. idea, right? And then people will worship in Buddhist temples and they basically, they fashion paper boats that they will Aww. light on fire and kind of push out and burn during the evening hours. Yeah, and the purpose like... of this custom is, of course, remembrance of the dead and, uh, again, like to... It's another method of freeing them. Um, there is just like the soul cake. Exactly, very cool. much so. There is a other sort of negative aspect to it too, though, where there's spirits known as pretas. Like I don't know how to pronounce this, or if mm. this is even spelled correctly, <coughs> but basically they are sort of evil spirits, um, spirits of those who have died as a result of an accident or a drowning or murder or something super negative. Obviously, right. Um, a lot of the times, consequently, these people were never buried. And so that's why their presence as these evil pretas and they walk amongst the living. So 
they were needing to deal with these more dangerous ones. And so there were societies uh, created and they were operated out of Buddhist temples and things like that. And they were perform ceremonies, ceremonies to that would also include the lighting of lanterns. So mm-hmm. very much like the other things we've talked about and recite sacred verses um, to ward off. Evil, okay. Essentially. That's interesting. The idea that they almost remind me of spirits locked in purgatory too, right? If they were like never like buried or like put away mm-hmm. so like you know that's mm-hmm. when well, we just listened to an astonishing legends episode about like the yokai yes. the japanese ghosts and stuff like that Freaky. and a lot of those ones like one of the stories they mentioned was yeah like a, a woman getting hit by a train or something and then like her ha- half severed body like crawled over and like said something to somebody on the platform but it's like they just covered her up and left her and mm-hmm. so she became one of those evil spirits it never buried like insulted basically you're laying there dying and that's, then you just ignored that's, that's where interesting. evil comes from <laughs> i have come across because i remember we were doing really early research for the show and i was coming up with lots of top 10 lists and yeah just like ghost stories and like cursed spirits that type of thing and i remember coming across this one japanese legend this is chinese obviously but it was a japanese legend i'm 90 percent sure of exactly that this uh, half of a woman's body that she like drags towards you and it's like this vision that appears to people at night in their bedrooms or wherever and it's like this effing creepy gory ghost monster thing yeah. of a woman that's like half yeah her, her legs are missing right and i was like that was right up there with like the red room i think that's with, one like, of the Japanese most famous legends. ones it is yeah. definitely one of the most famous yeah so freaky that's though. probably the one they were referencing now that i think of it. we were listening to it like falling asleep believe it or not and so I, <laughs> a little bedtime story. A little bedtime story of severed humans. No wonder you didn't sleep well that night. Yeah, no kidding. Maybe that was it. Oof. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you know what, guys? We uh, we're not done because uh, well, we're sort of we're we're wrapping up our conversation <clears throat> about the history of Halloween. We wanted to give you guys a special little Halloween treat. Yeah. In the form of three Halloween legends. Um, yeah, so we're just going to read those to you, and, uh, yeah, it's a trio of spooktacular Halloween myths that you may or may not have heard of. Um, I definitely went through, um, a large list of ones, like, you know, urban legends and stuff like that. Came up with three that I thought were particularly terrifying, so I hope you guys enjoy. Right. And we both hope you have a happy, happy Halloween, spooktacular festivities and all that stuff. Totally. We mm-hmm. hope you, uh, we hope you get really scared, but we hope you stay safe too. Yes. And, um... As usual, hit us up on our socials, Mm -hmm. um, reach out to us uh, into the portal mailbox at gmail.com. Come join us on our Facebook forum at Into the Portal Podcast. You can find us on Facebook. And don't forget to carve a pumpkin. Yeah, carve a pumpkin. I know you guys are going to be carving them anyway, and you can win some cool swag. Exactly. So until next week, have a happy Halloween and enjoy these legends. Legend number one, the Buckley family horror. One Halloween Eve long, long ago in a distant part of rural America, a group of youngsters thought up a ghoulish Halloween prank. It began in the whispers of the school halls and on the playgrounds and basements of family homes, a wicked deed to scare even the adults. The plan was to dress up a dummy for each household and execute it by beheading on All Hallows Eve. The body was to be left for all to see and to give trick-or-treaters a nasty surprise. The Buckley kids were thrilled at the macabre plan, but decided to put even a nastier twist on it. The Buckleys were a strange family, living on the edge of town and kept to themselves for the most part. Their business was unknown to the town folk, and siblings Susan and John Buckley were even stranger. Both donned clothes that were noticeably out of date, with Susan wearing a severe Victorian-era high-colored dress and John with his signature black overcoat and a pocket watch that looked older than time itself to the country kids that had never really seen things like this before. The Buckley pair seemed to keep to themselves, never opening up to outside friendships. It was really a topic of gossip amongst the town folk. Even beyond the scope of the playground, the whisperings of the Buckleys seemed always on the lips of one local or another. But that Halloween, the whispers would turn into something else an unspeakable horror that would befall the rural community. 
an evil so great and so unbelievable. On October 31st at dusk, Susan and John had just completed their daily chores. Tired and sweaty, they returned to their family homestead, with evil on their minds. Instead of placing the axe in its usual spot, wedged securely in its chopping block, John leaned it against the outside of the house as he entered the building. Susan remained outside, gathering kindling for the fire, as she normally did. The children looked at each other through the kitchen window, exchanging a glance that would send chills up the spine of any passerby. Mrs. Buckley, the mother, stood at the counter, scrubbing potatoes for their evening meal, unaware of the evil lurking in her household. She heard her daughter calling out to her from the barn, and wiping her hands on her apron, she glanced outside before stepping into her shoes to see what was the matter with Susan outside. As she exited the house, John followed behind her, silently retrieving the axe from beside the doorway. Mrs. Buckley was unaware of John as she approached the darkened barn. The entrance was ajar, and as their mother stepped through the threshold, a sickening thud landed the axe square in the back of her neck, her spine instantly crushed by the force of her son's blow. As her knees buckled, eyes opened wide with shock, the death blow was repeated. The bloody axe retched out of the cartilage and brought down again, the force of it partially separating the head from the shoulders, the sinewy connective tissues stretching and snapping as spurts of blood began gushing from the wound. As her mother lay dying on the straw floor of the barn, Susan emerged from the shadows, her eyes distinctly black with a red glow emanating from their depths. She looked at her brother, whose eyes had similarly transformed into gaping black holes. They were both grinning fiendishly as they stood over their dead mother. A ritual of the darkest nature took place in the barn that eve, and what remained of the souls of those two damned children were lost in that evil. Trick-or-treaters, who would later show up at the property, got the scare of their lives when they encountered a very real, very bloody remains of a body, that of Mrs. Buckley, partially eaten, her head placed neatly in her lap as she sat in repose on the front porch. The Buckley children disappeared into the night that Halloween, never to be seen again by their neighbors or anyone else. Legend number two, the 1962 Halloween Massacre. The night that Halloween 1962 was particularly dark, the yellow harvest moon had traced its way into a sliver of a crescent that hung in the sky. The celebrations were well underway in a rural Idaho town. It was a different time back then, a time when the best Halloween costumes were usually homemade and strictly designed to maximize the scare factor. One must-stop house party was already in full swing by the time the moon appeared. An enthusiastic partygoer decided to gather everyone for a snapshot of the festivities. Little did those present know that this would be the very last Halloween party they would ever get to take part in. Shortly before midnight, a costume man assumed to be part of the festivities began to unfold a sinister plot. Without anyone taking notice, the masked marauder traced the outside of the house, boarding up all exits out of the building. Slipping in through a secret entrance, the intruder chose his weapon, a regular old kitchen knife, and began ruthlessly slashing through the crowds of costume partygoers. Screams could be heard a block away as copious amounts of blood were sprayed across the walls, splattering all over the ceiling as the panicked crowd began running for the exits, only to find them all blocked. It is said that the masked murderer only got away with seven kills before disappearing into the Halloween night, never to be caught by Idaho authorities. Legend number three, the babysitter and the visitor. This frightening Halloween legend is vague, with its exactness of time and place being lost, something that's common over the years. But the story goes as follows. Jenny, 
A teenage girl living in the comforts of suburbia was tasked with babysitting her neighbor's children while they attended a Halloween party that evening on the 31st. It was the first year Jenny decided to stop trick-or-treating, because of course she was a big girl now, too mature to dress up and to beg for Halloween goodies. Mr. and Mrs. Smith had left for the evening, leaving Jenny with a number to call them in case of an emergency, in case anything should go awry. Jenny and the Smith children had a frightfully fun evening of trick-or-treating, followed by a showing of Beetlejuice before Jenny put the young ones to bed for the night, their bellies full of Halloween sweets. The doorbell had rung more than a few times, as the Smiths had gone all out in their Halloween decorations that year, with ghosts swaying from the tree branches hanging over top of a fully decked-out graveyard, tombstones, cobwebs, jack-o'-lanterns and all. Even the interior of the house was fully decorated as a house of horrors, with the decorations spewing out of all corners of the home. Kind of strange, Jenny thought to herself. Why would they go to all the trouble only to go out for the entire evening? But shrugging it off, the preteen microwaved herself a big bowl of popcorn before settling in to watch a horror movie of her own to cap off the Halloween Eve. Nestled on the sofa, Jenny couldn't help but feel as if she was being watched. The spooky decor of the house was kind of throwing her off. In particular, she felt the eyes of a life-size clown following her as she moved around the house that night, its dramatic makeup enhanced by the shadows of the night, turning something that Jenny used to find funny into something much more sinister. She wasn't exactly thrilled with all the Halloween decorations. At about 11.30, she picked up a phone call. It was the Smiths. Everything A-OK, Jenny reported, except for the spooky feeling she kept getting from the clown decoration seated in the corner of the room. Just then, Mr. Smith's voice faltered in response, after Jenny spoke the words over the phone. In a panicked voice, he said, What clown decoration? He then frantically demanded that she go wake up the children and exit the house as soon as they could. But before he could finish his sentence, the line went dead. Fear froze the blood in Jenny's veins as she realized that all was not quite right. As she dashed up the staircase, she swore she heard a soft, ominous giggling following close behind her. As she flung open the door to the children's bedroom, Jenny was pushed into the room herself, as a terrifying cackle broke out in a sing-song chorus of laughter. The Smiths arrived home minutes later, only to find the front door of their home wide open. Everything in place, except for their two children and the babysitter they had hired. The fate of the three victims remains unknown to this day. And that concludes our Halloween legends. We hope you enjoyed this special episode and we'll see you next week on the other side of the portal.